Greetings, scholars, and welcome to Following the Gong, a podcast of the Shire Honors College at Penn State. Following the Gong takes you inside conversations with our scholar alumni to hear their stories so you can gain career and life advice and expand your professional network. You can hear the true breadth of how scholar alumni have gone on to shape the world after they ran the gong and graduated with honors and learn from their experiences so you can use their insights in your own journey. This show is proudly sponsored by the Scholar Alumni Society, a constituent group of the Penn State Alumni Association. I'm your host, Sean Goheen, class of 2011 and college staff member. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. If you're a regular listener, welcome back. Anahan, class of 2010, is the Director of Judicial Clerkships in the Career Development Office at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law, and previously worked as an attorney for Covington and Burling after earning her Bachelor of Science in Bioengineering with honors in 2010 and her JD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Anna joins Following the Gone as a past board member for the Scholar Alumni Society to discuss her time as a scholar in biomedical engineering, pivoting from STEM to law, and her time as a teacher. She shares insights on her time on campus as an RA to off-campus in a paid co-op and competing on Jeopardy before her her early career as a teacher. Anna then dives into all things law, from approaching law school with an engineering background, the benefit of clerkships, working as a patent attorney, and now working at a law school. This episode is valuable for any scholar, and especially for those who are in STEM but are considering other paths, those pursuing teaching, and those interested in legal careers. Her full bio and a detailed breakdown of topics discussed are available in the show notes on your podcast app. With that, let's dive into our conversation with Anna Han following the gong. Joining me here today on Following the Gong is attorney and career services professional, Anna Han. Anna, thank you so much for joining us here on the show today. Thanks so much, Sean, for having me. It's so great to uh, have this opportunity to talk to scholars. Well, I'm excited that you're able to join us all the way from California here virtually today. And Anna, I always like to start by asking, you know, how did you first come to Penn State and the Schreier Honors College? Yeah, so I went to high school in Pennsylvania. My family still lives in Allentown, um, and I definitely heard of Penn State. I was interested in studying science and engineering, and Penn State was really strong in those areas. I applied to other schools that were strong in those areas. I don't remember exactly how I had heard of Schreier, but I was taking honors in AP classes. You know, there were people from my high school and class years above me who had gone to Schreier. So I thought it made sense to apply to the honors college. And when I was making my college decision, ultimately it came down to Penn State and Georgia Tech. I got waitlisted at Duke. Um, a lot of things weighed in Penn State's favor. You know, I'd gone into Schreier. I had a scholarship from the College of Engineering. I also have a much younger brother who is now a rising junior in the Honors College, and I wanted to be close to home to see him grow up, not not too close to home, so Allentown's still a few hours away. So ultimately, that's why I came to Penn State in the Honors College. I think that is definitely a good reason. I think family oftentimes is a driving factor for a lot of faults as well as the academics, and honestly, that was Duke's loss, so... (laughs) I'm glad that you were able to to stay home and go to Penn State and join us here at the Honors College. Now, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit in your story, and then we'll take a s- step back into your scholar days. But if you've read the show notes, you'll see that, you know, you've had a really cool career, but you didn't, you're not doing anything with engineering. So how did you realize once you got to Penn State and you're doing, you know, your honors work in engineering, how did you decide that that wasn't the path that you wanted to pursue? So I think this is, a, you know, a plug for experiential education, right? Like getting opportunities to actually observe and do the work that you think you want to do is often where you might learn, you know, you don't, you actually don't want to do it. So I had worked in different labs uh, at Penn State, including my honors thesis lab. I also did two co-ops at a consumer pharmaceutical company outside of Philadelphia. Um, So I did, you know, full time pharmaceutical work. And as I was going through those experiences, I realized I I wasn't passionate about 
the work that I thought I was going to be um, passionate about. And many people along alongside that I was working with, you know, were really passionate about that work. So I, I saw the contrast and I realized you know, this is probably not the path that I want to go down. As far as the work in STEM, you know, I didn't enjoy how isolating it was to do the kinds of experiments I was doing. I was working in the dark, looking under a microscope at slides for, you know, hours at a time. And it just felt like something that I didn't think I would want to make a career out of. And so around my junior year, uh, that was when I started thinking, you know, what else could be out there? I knew already at the time I was going to take a super senior year because I had done a co-op um, and it just pushed some of my class requirements back. So I knew I had a little bit of time still to figure it out. It's interesting because the things that you just said may be a reason for other students who want to pursue work in engineering if they enjoy like maybe they don't want to be around people terribly much and you're, <laughs> you're a people person I think from my experience with you and obviously the work that you're doing a lot of relational work in career services is that fair yeah I, I like to think of myself as an extroverted introvert like I, I get energy from being around people but I am shy to begin with and a little hesitant to kind of jump into those social situations but I really do enjoy you know, working on teams and being around others in professional and personal environments. I agree. That's kind of how I am too. Once, once, you know, things warm up a bit, I can kind of get going. So I can appreciate that. And for you listening, you know, I think a key takeaway here from Anna is there's that balance, of like what you're good at, what you enjoy and those situational pieces too really matter because you may have been good at the engineering things. Certainly you graduated with honors, but if that's what you're doing day in, day out. It's kind of miserable for you. Find something that gets you out of bed in the morning, right? Exactly. Yeah. My my husband is a scientist and that's really like all he wants to do. And I see the difference between us. Um, and I, I realize that, you know, I would not be good at his job. Um, and he has no interest in you know being a lawyer or doing career services. That's important to know. And you talked about experiences. So I want to dive in. You had some really cool experiences that you shared from your days on campus as a scholar. And I want to actually start first with the co-op. Can you talk about what a co-op is for students who may not be familiar? I think most people probably know what an internship is, but a co-op is a little bit different if you can quickly explain that. Sure. So uh, a co-op is an opportunity to work full time outside of, you know, the academic space at Penn State. So I essentially like my spring semester of junior year, I left, I moved to the Philadelphia suburbs, and I worked at McNeil Consumer Healthcare, which is uh, a Johnson and Johnson subsidiary, they make Tylenol, you know, a, a bunch of other med medications. So I was essentially like, embedded in one of their um, pharmaceutical groups. And we were working on Zyrtec. And I worked day in and day out on studying like formulation, studying the release of the drug, and basically performing and planning experiments to, to do that work. Um, it was a great opportunity to to get into the corporate world to see, you know, how different that was from working in labs at Penn State and also just a way to make more money <laughs> um, because that was a paid experience. That's definitely a plus when you can get paid for the experiences on campus or in a co-op or internship. And speaking of some ones that you had on campus, you shared also that you were both a resident assistant and a scholar assistant. So can you explain those roles? And if students are interested in those, what are they? Why why should they consider them if they're looking for different things to get involved with in the college or on the Penn State campus that they're at? Sure. Uh, I'll start with being a resident assistant. I was interested in doing that because, like I said, I'm an extroverted introvert. So I, I wanted to meet people. I wanted to kind of have an excuse to come out of my shell and walk around and, and talk to people on the first day of school. Um, and I, So I thought being a resident assistant was a way to accomplish that. For scholars, I assume, you know, if you live on campus, you have a resident an assistant, you know that they are a person that you can go to if you have any kind of challenges, you know, they can direct you to resources. Um, and they also are disciplinarians, right? They they go on duty, they make sure that the rules are being followed. I didn't love that piece of it. I, I don't find myself, you know, to be particularly stern in that way. But I learned a lot in the role about, you know, starting out and setting good expectations with residents for better or worse. I learned about, you know, crisis management and what to do in those types of emergency situations. So in order to become an RA, and I think this is still the case, I took 
uh, an RA class, you know, you learn in that class about being you know, a good listener, how to engage with other people, building trust in them, and how to have difficult conversations. And all of that has played out really well in my future careers. And the residence life community is so great. You know, it's so diverse in terms of people with personal identity, different personal identities, different backgrounds, and different professional aspirations. So we were all in different majors, you know, had, had different experiences. And I really valued getting that opportunity to meet people that I might not have been able to meet otherwise. Uh, and now I'll talk about being a scholar assistant. I was a scholar assistant my senior year in Atherton. I wanted to be more involved in the Honors College. And there were um, four scholar assistants. So we planned programs, um, mostly, you know, social types of programs like Simmons Atherton, Social Hour, SASH. I think that still occurs. And we also each worked with a member of the college staff. So I worked with Lisa Kurczynski, who was then the director of um, career development. So that was my first exposure to career services and higher ed in that sense, probably what sparked my interest in career services. Uh, so I planned programs with Lisa where we'd have alums come and talk to scholars about their career paths in different areas. Um, and one part of my job today is exactly that. So regardless of the different experiences you've had, you've been able to pull into, I'm sure you're using some of your engineering skills, but also the practical experiences from being an RA and working with people and the program planning from being an SA. So no matter what you go into, you can take skills from what seems like disparate experiences and use them regardless of what you end up doing. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of transferable skills to be learned in any experience. And you don't have to know what you want to do afterward or 10 years from then. But um, I think everything kind of compounds into something useful. And sometimes those experiences, Anna, are volunteer roles. So a lot of the ones you've already referenced have been paid gigs. But this one I kind of jumped out at me. You shared that you volunteered at the State Theater downtown. What inspired you to go volunteer at an arts venue as an engineering student? Yeah, so I think it's important to find balance in your life. You know, school is important, but it's also healthy to have a life outside of school too. The same would go for the workplace. So I had always really enjoyed, you know, live music and live theater. I'm a huge you know, Broadway fan. Um, so at Penn State, I'd seen shows at Eisenhower and the BJC and the State Theater. And so I was just looking for, you know, more opportunities to do that. And I think I'd seen on the State Theater website or in one of their emails that they were looking for volunteer ushers. And I thought, you know, what a great way to see shows that I wanted to see for free. So the commitment was, you know, you show up early, you hand out programs, you help people get seated, you know, find the restrooms and all of that. And then you just stay for the show and you clean up afterward. And, and I thought it was really fun to do that. Um, and I actually discovered one of my favorite bands today. They were co-headlining a show with Carbon Leaf. The band was Stephen Kellogg and the Sixers. And I had never heard of them before. And they turned out to be, you know, better than I, than, than I even thought Carbon Leaf was. So I've seen them probably like nine times since then. Sometimes you never know where those like formative things in your life are going to come from, you know, volunteering or saying yes to go. I think a past guest had talked about like, like a midnight breakfast kind of thing that they did with a roommate and like, they're like lifelong best friends now. And, you know, so saying yes to some of these little opportunities can have a big influence on you. Yeah, absolutely. This one, you need to answer this next one in the form of a question because it's time for a daily double. And I hope that's not copyright infringement. You were on this game show as a scholar. What is Jeopardy? More specifically, what is College Jeopardy? Um, I represented Penn State in the 2007 college championship. I think I was the first Penn Stater in that particular tournament. And it was really just a dream come true. I think people probably say this a lot about Jeopardy or, or being on TV. Um, I'd grown up watching Jeopardy with my parents at the dinner table. You know, I'd done um, academic team, like Quiz Bowl in high school. Um, you know, I just love trivia. Um, and it was one of the first years that they had an online test. So I still remember taking the online test in my room in Simmons. I went to a uh, in-person audition in New York. 
And then over spring break, uh, I think that was my sophomore year, I got the call to go on. I was at my parents' house and I was by myself. And I just remember like jumping up and down after I hung up. Um, And my show actually happened to air a little late in the semester, probably in May. And so I organized a watch party with my friends in the Atherton basement. I didn't win, sadly, but it was super fun. That is awesome. And of course, the Schreier Scholar would be the one representing the state <laughs> at the Collegiate Jeopardy. That is really, really cool. And I think we just recently had another student uh, go on the show, too, in the past year or so. Yeah, I think that's right. You set a nice legacy there and a foundation for, for us, Anna, to represent on kind of a classic American game show. And a final question before we get to your thesis about your undergrad experience. Can you tell the theme here is really just kind of the variety of different things you can do and not being tied down to what your major says. So in a great nod to the C in our mission, you created a club. So how did you go about that? Because a student may say, I have this interest, but there's not a registered organization for this yet. So how did you go about that? And what was so special about the one that you ended up making? Yeah, I think the lesson here is it's not that hard to start a club. If you feel like there's a gap that needs to be filled, you know, you can go and you know, submit the paperwork and get funding for your club and you never know what will happen in the process. So the club that my friends and I started was the Biomedical Sciences Club. My friend Kara, who had I also gone to high school with and also was a scholar. We went to a club fair at the beginning of our sophomore year. And there was a professor there who was really like recruiting students who were interested in biomedical sciences. And Kara was in the College of Ag. I was in the College of Engineering, but we were both interested generally in biomedical sciences. And it turned out the club didn't actually exist yet, but the professor was really interested in kind of spearheading something. So there were a handful of us who were interested, including my now husband, Dan, who was a biochem and molecular biology major in Eberly. Um, and I didn't know him before we started this club, but we all, you know, got together, created the structure and the vision along with Dr. Howell, the professor. And the goal was really to expose students to, you know, different careers in the biomedical sciences, you know, different research that was going on. And so we mostly brought professors from Penn State to talk about their research and about their career paths. And they were from all across the university. And we also sometimes would bring speakers from companies or or other universities that they were visiting campus to talk about themselves. And we kept this going for the years that I was in college. I think it still exists. And so um, for anybody who's listening, you know, if you're interested in the biomedical sciences, you should look up this club. Yeah, I can't speak to whether it's active or not. If it's active, go join it if that sounds like it's something of interest to you. And if it's if it's not active, well, maybe you could be the one to follow in Anna's shoes and get it going again if it for some reason has gone inactive. Right, exactly. And so speaking of kind of the hard science part of your story here, time to talk thesis. So how did that fit into your educational journey as an engineering student? And long term, what impact has it had on your career from the skills and lessons learned element of the experience? Because I'm assuming you're probably not using the technical laboratory piece in a career services role. But how has it helped you regardless of what the topic was? Yeah, I did my thesis in a neuroscience lab. So the professor who is no longer at Penn State, Dr. Gong Chen, he was in Everly. But I was really interested in his research. He was doing you know really cool work on neurodegeneration. And I sought him out. And I was able to still get honors in bioengineering because the research was closely related enough and I just needed to get an additional thesis reader from bioengineering on my committee. Pretty simple to get honors even outside of my particular major. The research itself was on neuronal polarity and how certain proteins impact the the development of neurons. Um, So we were studying essentially abnormal development and how you could try and rescue the abnormal development. Um, So the implications were there for, you know, diseases like Parkinson's. Like I said before, I think that's where I realized, though, you know, I didn't want to go into graduate school for STEM. But the skills I learned were, were really helpful. You know, I was planning experiments. I was kind of thinking ahead to different outcomes and what ifs. Um, Obviously, I did technical writing and I also did literature review where I was reading technical papers. And for bioengineering, I don't know if this is still the case. We actually had to do a thesis defense. So we had to do an oral presentation of our research to our thesis committee and then answer questions. Certainly all those skills applied 
to my later career as a patent litigator, um, you know, I was reading technical papers and patents. I was trying to synthesize complicated information. I was helping to plan out case strategy and what would happen if the judge said this and what would happen if, you know, the judge ruled against us on something. And I also had to do presentations and negotiate with the other side. So all of those things, I think really at the time I wouldn't have foreseen would be useful necessarily in a career as a lawyer, but for my particular practice, it's they definitely were. That is awesome. I think, you know, some students say like, oh, I don't want to go to grad school. How is this useful? And I think the experience of writing at the project management and being able to, in your case, go through lots of, I'm sure, very dry technical <laughs> documents was very, very helpful. Yeah, definitely. And I would say today, you know, in preparation for this, I looked at my thesis and I was like, this almost feels like a foreign language. Like, I don't remember, you know, a lot of it, unfortunately. And I, I it just is so far removed now from the work that I have done. But still useful nonetheless. Yes. So, and we're going to shift into your career now. And at the time of recording, you're in your early 30s, like I am, and you're certainly still early in your career, but you've done a lot. So we're going to dive into that. So you said you didn't want to go to grad school for STEM. You didn't want to go engineering. So how did you decide which path you were going to take coming out? So kind of going from the negative to the positive here. Like, So walk us through that decision-making process, the research how did you figure out what those next steps were? Yeah, so even even as I was continuing the engineering path, I knew that I had an interest in teaching. Uh, and that started even before college. My parents immigrated from China with me when I was very young. And I saw that you know, as their education and socioeconomic status improved, so did my, my quality of education as I was going to different public schools. The unfortunate reality, of course, is that the quality of schools oftentimes depends on where someone is located. And, and so my awareness awareness of that growing up made me want to give back and, and teach in an underserved school. In high school, I participated in the Pennsylvania Governor's School for Teaching, and that's where I first heard about Teach for America, which is an organization that, that trains and places teachers in underserved schools to teach for two years, you know, minimum of two-year commitment. So in college, I worked for Teach for America. I worked on campus as a campaign coordinator, meaning I gave dozens of presentations to classes and student organizations. Scholars listening to this may have I've heard from a campus campaign coordinator during their time on, on campus. I also worked in New York for a summer for the Teach for America Training Institute there. So given those experiences, I was pretty sure that I wanted to apply and I was lucky enough to, to get in. Um, at the same time, I didn't think I was going to be a teacher forever. So that's why I was looking at other career paths and ultimately applied to law school as well. I'm curious because like kind of reading through the questionnaire answers that you shared. And again, if this is your first time listening there's a questionnaire I share with our guests that helps me write the questions I'm asking. And I want to know, what was it like being a teacher without a teaching degree? And what advice would you give for scholars who go, you know, whether it's through Teach for America or just kind of independently, but end up in a similar position? There are a lot of places where you can get, you know, alternative certifications. You know, I think being a new teacher is hard regardless of whether you have a teaching degree or not. But if you have a teaching degree or you have student teaching experience or have worked or volunteered in schools before, for it's certainly going to make the learning curve less steep. Teach for America has a summer training where you teach summer school for maybe you know a few hours a day for a few weeks, and it's really like a crash course in lesson planning and classroom management and how to you know do the kind of nuts and bolts as a teacher. But it's also a very artificial environment, right? Like my summer school class was tiny. I had uh, a co-teacher. I was only teaching one subject, and then you fast forward to the fall. I'm planning algebra one and geometry. I have six class periods. I've like got, you know, 150 students or something and I'm the only one. So it was really intimidating, but I had a great support system. And I think that's really important to find you know, colleagues and peers who are in the same boat as you, who you can talk to and brainstorm about simpler ways to do things or being more efficient and effective in your job. And I think my RA training really helped in terms of setting expectations early. You know, I was known as a no-nonsense teacher very early on because I learned as an RA, you know, you can always get more lenient, but you can't really unring the bell if you start letting students get away with things at the beginning of the school year. So I think, you know, for people who are interested in teaching, there are different routes to that. And I think there's definitely a benefit to getting a degree. You know, once I was in my master's program for education policy, there were a lot of times where I thought, wow, I wish I'd known this as a teacher 
or wow, this explains so much about my teaching experience. And I think, you know, it would be great if we valued teachers more and really, you know, thought of it as a profession where people should be getting, you know, a lot of education and, and, and higher education in terms of professional degrees. I think we do students a disservice and in, in not doing that. But I think that there's still a high need in many places. You know, when I was teaching in Memphis at the time, like my students had like a full time substitute for half the year for social studies. Right. So there's a balance there of, of wanting, you know, the most educated teachers that you can get, but also needing to fill positions that are available. I think that's all really, really good insight for students who maybe end up teaching if that's something that they decide that they want to do or, or try out for a little bit. And you know, obviously, I think there's a lot more we could do for teachers. That's That could be its own. I'm sure this whole podcast yes. about that out there. So we're not going to dive into that. But did you go into it knowing that it was going to be like a short term thing? Or did you decide once you were there that, okay, I need to think about what my next step is? So I was pretty sure that I wanted to go to law school. By the time that I was, you know, in my senior year and into my super senior year, I was fairly sure, like I didn't see teaching as a a long-term career. So I applied to law school at the same time I applied to Teach for America. And when I got into law school, I deferred to do Teach for America for two years. And so I kind of had a five-year plan at that point. I was going to do Teach for America for two years, and then I was going to go to law school for three years. So can you walk us through kind of your law school experience from taking the LSATs? We already talked about the teaching, so we'll just pretend you went from (laughs) applying and deciding, you know, how did you look at schools, decide which one to go to, and then through the L1, L2 interning and and everything up through graduation. Yeah, absolutely. So I remember taking the LSAT the summer before my last year of college. I was at Penn State working on my thesis through a summer discovery grant, but I was studying for the LSAT at the same time. I remember, you know, looking at the books in the Schreier Garden. And I think, you know, deciding where to apply really depended on, you know, my, my LSAT score and where it would be like close to the median of that law school. And GPA is also a component of that. And so I ended up applying to like maybe five or six schools. Penn was one of them. Duke was one of them. And I actually got into Duke. And I was looking at schools, you know, that had good career outcomes. I think that's really important, right? Because law school is a professional school. And so anybody considering law school should be looking at where did the graduates from that school get jobs and, you know, what kinds of jobs. So that was definitely an important piece for it. I decided on going to law school in the first place because I thought it was a good mix of my skills and interests. Um, I had a friend who uh, had gone to Pitt, studied chemistry, and had this goal of becoming a patent lawyer. And so as I was talking with him about his process, you know, I realized this sounds like a good mix for me in terms of, you know, getting to do technical related work, but not you know, working in a STEM lab. And I also got to meet a patent lawyer at Johnson & Johnson when I was working on my co-op. So, you know, getting to talk to folks who had already gone down this path was really useful for me. And then law school itself, I mean, it's challenging the first year, especially. Um, you're kind of dropped into this environment where it's unlike any other class that I had taken, at least, where they're just huge classes. You're learning a brand new language, a brand new topic, at least for me, coming from from STEM. And there was just, you know, a pretty steep learning curve. You know, there aren't any prerequisites to being a lawyer. So, you know, you're in a class with people who study all kinds of things. I will say, I think it's useful to get work experience before going to law school. I think that really helped me in terms of just getting some perspective about working in the real world, especially coming from teaching, you know, law school felt like it was really selfish. Like all I had to do was worry about myself and it felt very low stakes. Like the only thing was really my career outcome at the end. So it gave me perspective. You know, when a professor called on me in class doing the Socratic method and I didn't have the right answer, it wasn't the end of the world um, at that point. And so I thought that was really important. So, you know, my view is no one should go to law school if they don't want to be a lawyer, but you, you should make sure that you 
are getting the information that you need to make that decision. I feel like for a lot of my classmates, they had done paralegal work before law school. And I think that gave them, you know, a healthy understanding of what it was like to be a lawyer. And they, I think, had to kind of step up in terms of knowing the legal jargon already and how things operated. You know, there was folks with lots of different backgrounds. And so you were able to bring both your engineering undergrad and your teaching experience. So how did that help you in the academic sense? I know you said like perceptually, that's a word, you know, it wasn't the states of like, you know, the impacting a student's future, but, you know, still helpful nonetheless. So how did that for students who maybe are coming from, you know, I'd say a less traditional major like mine, like political science or history, the ones that commonly feed into law school students, how did the engineering help you? I think people coming from STEM backgrounds, one, there's a benefit in terms of the way that you're already taught to think in terms of the the logical thinking skills. You know, part of the LSATs at the time was like a lot a logic games section. Um, so I think STEM majors tend to do well on, on that. I think in terms of substance, like teaching really helped me with time management. Um, it really helped me with trying to, you know, break down complicated topics into like bite-sized chunks that I could teach every day. And that translated to law school where you're reading pretty complicated cases, you're outlining them, you're trying to pick out the most important details. And so I think that, you know, my past experiences helped me in law school, even though they were completely new subject areas. Transferable skills, kind of important. Might be a theme of this episode, you know? Yeah. Now, Anna, you decided to torture yourself a little bit. Uh, (laughs) Some law programs allow you to pursue a concurrent degree. can be a master's in different topics, sometimes an MBA. You pursued one in educational policy. So what drove you to do do that? And how did you balance that additional workload? I already knew that I was going to Penn, I had decided, and the school's really known for like cross-disciplinary education. So there are a lot of joint degree opportunities. There are a lot of certificate programs that you could do with other schools at Penn. And I knew that Penn had a great education school. It was going to be possible to get two degrees without extending my time in law school. And by the time I applied, you know, I was already in my first year of teaching. I really enjoyed it. I thought I might want to do something in education. Education one day, particularly in education policy, because that's where you know a lot of the important decision making is happening. Um, so I thought a master's in education policy was going to give me credibility in the future if I wanted to continue in education. And uh, we're gonna jump ahead a little bit. So obviously, you went and worked for a law firm for several years, did the associate thing. I think I've we've had some previous guests who've covered that sort of thing. So and you can really help scholars. So we're just gonna jump ahead to what you're doing now at UC Berkeley School of Law. So can you just explain what you do there first, and then we'll dive into the different types of opportunities that law students can explore? Sure. So I work in the Career Development Office at Berkeley Law. I am the Director of Judicial Clerkships, which means I counsel students and alumni who are interested in working for judges at a state or federal court. Clerkships are a really great opportunity to see how a court system works, to understand how judges make their decisions, and to build your research and writing and critical thinking skills. As a clerk, you get to review the arguments from both sides. You get to work with the judge to figure out, you know, essentially like who who is making the better argument under the law. Like what does the law say and what should the outcome be in this particular case? So you get to do um, drafting of final orders or opinions for the judge. You get to you know sit in on trials if you're working at a, at a trial court. And it's just a really valuable experience for anybody who wants to be a litigator, especially, and, and be in, in a courtroom um, in the future. So I clerked for a federal judge in Memphis right out of law school uh, for one year, and most of the clerkships are temporary. They're one or two years, and then you pursue other more permanent opportunities. So how did you talk about your clerkship when you were going for your litigator role? that you had? Yeah. So I don't know if that is necessarily the, the right way to go about it, because in law school, like you work your first and second summer. So I already knew that I was going to work at the law firm after graduation. And I got the clerkship 
and deferred the law firm. So they didn't actually hire me even on the basis of, of knowing that I got the courtship. But definitely like really valuable experience in terms of building the skills that I was talking about. Also, you know, I just happened to work at a firm that got a case that was filed in front of the judge that I clerked for. And so, you know, a partner initially just said, Hey, Anna, we have this case before your judge. Like, can we just chat about, you know, how the judge thinks and, and what you know about, you know, his, his past decisions. And then there was a need for an associate on that case. So I got pulled on to it because I had quirked for him. And so it was a great way for me to get more experience and get on a cool case because I had quirked for the judge. So for students who are exploring law school or are in maybe they're a young alum listening and they're in law school, what should they be doing like right now to prepare themselves to take advantage of these opportunities beyond kind of the standard internship, internship, I guess you've got to maybe get a little bit of time off after you graduate and then you go do whatever job that you got. Yeah, I, I think for scholars who are thinking about law school, like I said, I think it's important just to learn more about the experience that you're going into. So if you have opportunities to talk to a lawyer or shadow a lawyer, or if you have an idea of what career you think you want, you know, take a look at that person's bio, you know, on LinkedIn or on their website, and you can see, you know, what internships have they done or what clerkships have they done and where have they worked before? You know, if you could work for a judge as an undergrad, great. I know not everyone can, you know, these jobs are often unpaid, unfortunately, but that is another experience that can help you decide what it is you want to do. And within law, there's just so many different opportunities. It's not necessarily that just because you go to law school, you have to be a trial lawyer and you show up in court like law and order, right? There are many different career paths in the law. Yes, you can do litigation and be in court, but there's also, you know, corporate and transactional work, which is less adversarial. You're, you know, working to get to an outcome that everybody wants, right? You're working on a, a merger, you're working on a sale, or you're working in tax or real estate. And so those are things where you're not really, there's nothing really in dispute besides the terms that you want to agree on to get to an outcome. And then just know that there are a lot of different sectors that you can work in too. So you can work in the private sector and you can work for a law firm or a company, um, but you also have public sector employees like state, federal, local governments. You have public interest employers who are you know, nonprofits or their legal aid organizations. So there's a lot of different paths to pursue after you know, just going to law school. Yeah, some past guests that we've had, we've had some folks who've worked more. Uh, we've had a patent attorney, John Hemmer, on one of our earliest episodes, kind of similar work to what you have done. I think you were a little bit more on the litigation side. I think he's a little bit more on the client side, helping them file patents and things. You know, other folks who have been in-house counsel for companies and they're doing contracts and like you said, it's less adversarial. I think the only time I've currently employed a lawyer was buying a house and that's not adversarial at all typically right. um you know we're the closing and doing the deed and all the, the legal paperwork involved there but i, I do want to actually go back I, I kind of put my foot in my mouth a little bit i do actually do want to hear a little bit about the work that you were doing before because you talked about some of these cases and being in the litigation side of things so what was that like being on a, on the litigation part of a case, you know, because you you were a patent attorney and technical things like that and helping people defend their copyrights, their intellectual property. So can you just talk a little bit about what that specific type of law was like? Absolutely. So most of my work involved representing large pharmaceutical companies in legal disputes. So in their litigation, most of the matters were involving infringement of their patents. There are both utility patents and design patents. So I worked on a variety of matters involving either of those. Um, I also worked on at least one matter where they were trying to defend a trademark. And so, you know, after a lawsuit is filed, the attorneys will review documents, they will do the case law research, they'll look at, you know, what are the applicable cases in this particular dispute, will draft memos or legal briefs that get filed by the court, and then the court will decide, you know, who's right or wrong. And then if you move further forward in the case, 
there are depositions, um, and then you may actually get to trial where you put witnesses on the stand and you have to prepare those witnesses and you have to also prepare cross-examination for the other side's witnesses. Sometimes those cases can be, you know, fairly long and drawn out. And, you know, I did a variety of other like kind of science patent related work in, in terms of, you know, reviewing patents for companies that did want to do a sale. Um, so that was not adversarial, but I still got to bring in my science expertise, my technical background. And I also got to do a lot of pro bono work for students who don't know pro bono work is the client is not paying, but the attorney is doing the work for, for free for the client. And so the firm that I was at Covington had a really strong pro bono practice. Um, they really you know, supported attorneys who wanted to do pro bono work. And one of my most important cases was representing prisoners in Mississippi who uh, were in a class action lawsuit. The claims at issue were they were suffering from you know, excessive use of force, that they were receiving inadequate medical and mental health care at a facility that was specifically designed or supposed to be the mental health facility for, for prisoners with mental health issues. And I worked on that case for a couple of years. Ultimately, we went to a five-week trial and the firm sent a whole team down to Mississippi um, to, to participate in the trial. And it was really rewarding work. Unfortunately, we lost the case, but you know our clients got to have their day in court. And I think that's one part of litigation that I think is really important is recognizing that, that people deserve to have their, their claims heard and that people have the opportunity to get a chance at justice. Well, that is really cool of the firm to be able to support that. And as you were talking about the first part, you know, it's really cool that you're currently able to call back to your experience in your current role with Lisa Kay as a scholar assistant. And in that case, a lot of your cases, you were able to call back probably on your co-op at Johnson & Johnson. Yep, absolutely. I think there were times, you know, every patent is different. Every case is going to be new. There's no way to necessarily already know everything going into it. But, you know, my familiarity from reading technical documents and reading patents for my time in college was, was certainly helpful in understanding some of the jargon. Absolutely. Now, outside of work... Anna, you were previously a board member for the Scholar Alumni Society, and all of your professions, teaching, legal, career services, all of those lend themselves to professional and volunteer roles. So how do you approach those sorts of opportunities? And if you can explain that in a way that scholars could learn the value of getting involved in your industry. Yeah, I think in terms of networking, that's been super important of just getting to build my professional network and know people who have done similar things or know people who can help introduce you to other folks, um, I think has been really useful. I think that, you know, you never know who you're going to meet and you never know who one day, you know, might reach out to you for an opportunity or that you, you know, might find interesting in terms of getting information about a, a new job or a new position. It's funny when I interviewed for my current job in the career development office, you know, I went back to my law school clerkships counselor and I said, hey, can I talk to you about what it is your role is? And so I think in all of those different career and, and volunteer roles, you know, just making sure that you're building relationships and, and keeping that going can it can be really helpful. So what kind of questions about either career services jobs, law school, education, legal practice and clerkships should I have asked that I just didn't know to? Or maybe put a different way, what are some questions that you often get from student mentees that you could answer here? I think one question is, you know, in the application process, I worked with a lot of students who are applying to judges. And I talked to a lot of students who are applying to law school. And I think it's important for people to know that you can take it in, in bite-sized pieces. It seems daunting at the very beginning, but you know, breaking it down into little steps of, you know, I'm going to work on my resume. And then, you know, I'm going to work on my cover letter and I'm going to work on my essays, right? I think one piece that is common, both in applying to law school and applying to clerkships is letters of recommendation. And so that's one part where I would say, you know, start to think about who your recommenders would be, start to think about, you know, are there professors that you um, have enjoyed working with? Are there professors who would be able to say good things about you in 
a letter of recommendation. I remember when I applied to law school, I asked my honors advisor and he he was like, I've never written a letter of recommendation for law school before. I, you know, I'm an engineering faculty. So I actually like photocopied sections from uh, like a how to get into law school book about letters of recommendation. And I provided that to my professor to say, like, here's what law schools are looking for. Like, if you can, you know, somehow like make your letter sound like it's covering these things, that would be really great. So I think that is something just to keep in mind that, you know, you want to make things easy for your recommenders and you want to provide them with the information that they need to help sell you to a law school or to a judge. That is a really good point. And that also applies for job references generally, med school, graduate programs outside of law. So, and I like the going above and beyond with the yeah. taking the book samples there for, for your professor. That's awesome. Now, Anna, this is uh, the last part we do with everybody here. And this is your chance to brag. What would you say is your biggest success to date? Besides being a parent and making it through the first year of, of parenting a child, I would say my biggest success to date does feel like the the pro bono case that I got to work on when I was at Covington, you know, even though our clients lost, it was a, a chance for them to have their story heard by a federal judge, you know, in public court. Um, we had good publicity for it in the local press. The New York Times even came and did a story. And so I think throughout the course of the case, the conditions at the prison did improve because there was awareness about it, because, you know, the people running the prison knew that there were eyes on this. And so certainly like by the end of the case, the prison was not how, you know, we as the attorneys for our clients would have wanted it to be, but we knew that things had gotten better because, you know, we had represented them. Yeah, absolutely. When I was reading your bit about that in advance, it was like you got it not only in the federal court, but you also got it out into the court of public opinion, which is its own beast. Yes, <laughs> so exactly. So able to leverage that on your, behalf of your clients as well. Now, and on the flip side of that, though, what would you say is the biggest transformational learning moment or mistake that you've had and what you learned from that experience moving forward? My time teaching was certainly challenging. You know, I, like I said, I think the first year of teaching is hard for, for everybody. I think that was a point where I realized, you know, up until then, the inputs that I I had kind of reflected the outputs, you know, I, I would work hard at something and I would kind of get the outcome that I had intended or that I wanted. And and teaching wasn't really like that. And I remember visiting one of my high school teachers over Thanksgiving break, my first year of teaching. And I and he asked, how how is it going? He was a math teacher too. And he was like, how's it going? And I said, well, it's really hard. And he said, yeah, like teaching is one field or profession where the inputs just don't necessarily match the outputs. It was frustrating to me, but it was, I realized, you know, a lot of people feel this way. And this is just a, a reality of the profession. And I think from then on, I tried to really figure out, you know, what is within my locus of control? What are the things where I can actually have the inputs match the outputs and try hard at that? And then, you know, just be okay with kind of letting go of control. I think that's really important to understand in all aspects of your life. Like, no. <laughs> and you referenced being a parent earlier. Yes, so certainly can, parenting. Yes. Or like, which are the, which of these things uh, do I want to deal with or not? I think that's a good thing to to learn at some point early early on. Now, Anna, this next question you may be able to build on your answer about the the letters of rec. How do you approach mentorship, both as a mentor and a mentee, and how can students proactively seek out those opportunities and make sure that they're getting a variety of of mentors in their in their life and career? I think it starts with you know finding people that you admire or finding people that you feel like you know you have a good connection with, and then from there, I think it's incumbent on the mentee to really keep the conversation going and to ask for what they need, even if they don't know what it is that they need, like just asking questions generally, like, how did you, you know, get to the career that you're in? You know, what advice do you have from me because I am doing X, Y, Z things, or I'm trying to apply to, you know, these opportunities and, and keeping your mentor engaged in you is, is really, I think the, the key part of it, because it's easy to just get lost in the day to day of other things and get that relationship to kind of trickle, trickle away. I admit that as a mentee, I'm also not that great at keeping in touch and keeping my mentors engaged, but I think it's something, you know, that everybody can work on. There are no dumb questions, I think is also uh, good to remember. I have 
a lot of students that I work with who are like, this is going to be a dumb question. And I just tell them, you know, it's better that you ask than to go down this path, not knowing and assuming something that is wrong. So definitely, you know, keep asking questions and keep your mentors engaged. I think people really want to know what's going on with their mentees. They want to be invested in their success and celebrate their success with them. Next time you watch any episode of a sitcom that will reinforce the point Anna made about just ask or just, you know, point, clarify something because there, there are no dumb questions. Almost every sitcom plot would be resolved <laughs> within the first five minutes if somebody had just asked a clarifying question <laughs> early on, right, Anna? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the episodes are all about miscommunication. So you want to yep. make sure that you are communicating clearly. Yes, don't be those people. Be the ones that ask, even if it's a silly question, ask it, because better to know the answer, right? Now, Anna, you did name drop a few people along the way, but if you have any professors or friends from your days as a scholar that you want to give a shout out to, along with maybe the late, great Alex Trebek. <laughs> yes, definitely Alex Trebek. I'll also put a plug in for Johnny Gilbert, who is the announcer for Jeopardy. There is a photo of me and my brother with Johnny Gilbert that was my Facebook profile photo for a little while. So Dr. Howell, like I mentioned, he's responsible for starting my medical sciences club with us and introducing me to my husband. Dr. Hancock was my honors advisor who helped me get into law school. Um, Dr. Chen was my thesis advisor who also helped me get into law school, even though he had also never had any students apply to law school before. And I made a lot of great friends at Penn State. One group in particular stands out. Most of us were scholars and we started an email chain after college to stay in touch. Um, we called it the happiness thread because it was first conceived as like a way to share gratitude and and you know, memorialize the positive things that had happened to us. But it turned into something much greater. It turned into just, you know, keeping in touch with each other, sharing highs and lows, getting advice, venting, all of that. And we kept that going for, for many years. So from the time I was teaching through law school, um, it was really important to me to have that outlet during what was, you know, pretty challenging years for me professionally. And so I, I really appreciated that. And I would say, you know, keep in touch with your friends that you made in college. Well, this if you've fallen out of touch, sharing this when it's published is a great way to to get that thread going again. So shameless little plug there for this. We started it up again during the pandemic and we added, you know, spouses and we added other people. Um but it has been a while. I think family and, and other obligations have gotten in the way. Absolutely. I, I think I shared this on the episode that I was interviewed on here where that meme of adulthood where it's and friendship is like, oh, we should hang out. And you keep saying that back and forth until one of you dies. Like, I, I think that's a real <laughs> meme. Um, that one's pretty accurate. So good chance to pick up, pick up the thread there. Yeah, I want to recruit people also to just move to Berkeley because most of my friends are still on the East Coast. <laughs> well, you know, if you have any questions about that, we didn't even talk about moving to California. But maybe as we're wrapping up here, Anna, if you want to leave some final advice, maybe about that or something else that you want to help scholars make the most of their time in the college, including your brother, uh, how can how can they do that? Being flexible and being open to new things is really you know my my kind of parting advice. It's okay to change your direction if you feel like you're going down a path that you're not going to be happy with. In terms of moving to California, like that's something I never would have expected. Graduating from Schreier or even graduating from law school, I figured I was going to practice on the East Coast. I really, you know, wanted to be in Pennsylvania kind of long term. And so I took the Pennsylvania and New Jersey bar exams. I have never practiced in Pennsylvania or New Jersey. Uh, so I think, you know, just uh, be be okay with the unexpected and unpredictable. That is solid advice, no matter what major or profession you are in. Now, Anna, if a scholar does want to reach out to you and they have questions about any of the different experiences you have, maybe about clerkships and what they can be doing now to prepare, how can they connect with you? I'm happy to connect with anyone on LinkedIn. You can find me. I'm Anna Han. I'm the director of judicial clerkships at Berkeley Law. I think somebody from uh, a student organization, Empowering Women in Law, had reached out earlier this year on LinkedIn, and I presented virtually to, to their club this past semester. So I'm happy to, to talk to anybody who's interested in teaching the law, career services, bioengineering. I, don't, I mean, I think they're probably better people for you to talk to if you're interested in bioengineering. But um, yeah, people should feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. Well, if they're bioengineering, but they don't want to do bioengineering. I think Anna, you are a exactly. <laughs> perfect person to talk to. And now for a really, really hard hitting question, probably harder than anything you ever experienced in any deposition or trial or on the LSAT or on a bar exam. If you were a flavor of Berkey Creamery ice cream, Anna, 
which would you be? And most importantly, why would you be that flavor? I love this question. I think it's so fun to hear what other people have said. I would be alumni swirl, not just because I really like the flavor, but because I love being an alum of Penn State. I love being, you know, a Teach for America alum, a Penn Law alum. I think they're just great communities to be part of and to stay involved with. And so that is why I choose Alumni Swirl. Well, as the alumni relations professional for the Honors College, I fully support that. And we have another entry on Team Alumni Swirl. At this point, we've got the three distinct categories of Alumni Swirl, WPSU Coffee Break, and the rest of the menu. So we'll talk <laughs> one up for Alumni Swirl here on that team. Anna Han, thank you so much for joining us here today on Following the Gone. I really appreciate learning about your story and all of your great advice on you know being a STEM major who doesn't want to STEM after college and your insights on teaching and on law. And I learned a lot about clerkships personally. I wasn't familiar with that. So I learned something. I hope you listening learned a lot. You heard how you can follow up with Anna if you want to keep the conversation going. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, scholars, for listening and learning with us today. We hope you will take something with you that will contribute to how you shape the world. This show proudly supports the Schreier Honors College Emergency Fund, benefiting scholars experiencing unexpected financial hardship. You can make a difference at raise.psu.edu forward slash Schreier. Please be sure to hit the relevant subscribe, like, or follow button on whichever platform you are engaging with us on today. You can follow the college on Instagram and LinkedIn to stay up to date on news, events, and deadlines. If you have questions about the show or are a Scholar alum who'd like to join us as a guest here on Following the Gone, please connect with me at scholaralumni at psu.edu. Until next time, please stay well, and we are...